In the 19 noughts, humanity learned to fly. In the 1910s, humanity learned to fly well. In the 20s, people transitioned from aviation's wood age to the metal age, and in the 30s, the power of flight was spread to the masses for the first time. In the 1940s, the jet age arrived on the scene, with the promise and potential to change everything. But by the 1950s, one critical tool still eluded the aviators of the world. VTOL. Vertical takeoff and landing wasn't entirely a secret. The world's first helicopter had flown just two weeks after the start of World War II. But until the power to take off and land without a runway could be combined with the power to fly like the best aircraft of the time, aviation still left something to be desired. And with a Cold War underway, nobody could afford a second place trophy in the VTOL race. For the US Navy, the VTOL problem was solved by the Pogo. One part helicopter, one part high performance fighter plane, and about 10 parts that's crazy, the Pogo is among the most harebrained prototypes in aviation history, but it also nearly worked. We've already covered the importance of vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, or VTOLs, very briefly, but it's important to understand just why VTOL was so important, so that we can understand why the United States was willing to go to such ridiculous lengths in order to get the technology. VTOL had been on the wish list for the Allied forces since the end of the Second World War, largely because of the advantages it offered in getting ground troops to locations where they weren't expected. If the US could, say, lure a few thousand enemy troops into a massive battle at a fixed location and then safely deposit several hundred soldiers in their back lines, that battle would be over before it really started. So too could troops land at locations away from the front lines, carry out operations, and then leave with minimal casualties, just flying back to the place they'd come from. Finally, constructing runways was one of the most time-consuming, tedious, and strategically costly things that you could do in wars of the mid-20th century, and if troops' forward positions could be supplied, reinforced, and given air support without having to build a runway, they were at a massive advantage. But although helicopters were slower, had a worse time protecting themselves, and offered less in the way of versatility, especially in the post-war years, they were good enough to do the job until technology was ready to make VTOL aircraft happen at their own pace. Or helicopters were good enough most of the time, with one key exception. Across all of World War II, there were few lessons more important that when it came to operations at sea, the presence of aerial assets was the difference maker between life and death. Ships that could operate within range of an aircraft carrier usually had it pretty good, while those that didn't found themselves in more trouble more frequently. Germany and Japan had been caught somewhat off guard by just how effectively the Allies had used their air power, but the Soviets knew precisely what the playbook was from the United States, and if the two superpowers ever found themselves at war, the Soviets would understand that by America's own logic, any US ship without aircraft coverage was basically just a sitting duck. So, by 1947, as the first jet-powered aircraft were still puttering across the skies above Europe and North America, America's Navy was already looking into a new take on the VTOL design. Designated Project Hummingbird, the initiative used captured information and material from a World War II-era German test program. Unlike the aircraft the Army was considering around the same time, the Navy's design was meant to be a light aircraft, a fighter if possible, something that required no runway space and could park in one or threes or fives on the decks of a wide range of ships. Their profile ideally would be small enough that they wouldn't interfere too badly with day-to-day -day ship operations, and in a crisis, they weren't intended to win major battles all by themselves. Instead, they would be a delay tactic, buying precious minutes to slow down an enemy air attack before help could arrive from somewhere else, or otherwise just doing their best to ward off enemy planes before those planes inevitably ran low on fuel and had to turn back. At other times, they could conduct a reconnaissance role, scouting for submarines on the sea, or scoping out targets in advance of a small-scale raid. Even in small numbers, such an aircraft could contribute massively to the situational awareness and survivability of non-carrier naval task forces, merchant convoys, and even individual ships working far from support. In 1951, two companies were awarded contracts and asked to design and construct an X-plane, a proof-of-concept aircraft that would form the basis for later production designs. Those two companies, Lockheed and Convair, were actually each supposed to build two X-plane copies, but in an indicator of just how difficult this task would prove to be, neither of them would ultimately produce a second copy of their design. Lockheed's design was designated XFV, sometimes referred to as the Salmon, and spoiler alert, it never completely 
completed a vertical takeoff and landing sequence and was unable to fly horizontally. Convair, however, got better resources from the program and had a bit more success overall. Convair would produce the XFY, a bumbling little aircraft that would, in time, show why it deserved the bouncy little nickname that it ultimately received, Pogo. Just a first glance, it should be clear that the Pogo was an odd little duck, largely owing to the strangeness of its wing design. The Pogo was a propeller plane, not a jet like the ones that were becoming popular in both the American and Soviet arsenals, but it boasted a set of triangular delta wings. Those were not the sort of thing that one would expect to find on a propeller aircraft of any kind, certainly not one this small, yet the delta wings weren't even the strangest thing about it. Instead, that would be its lower fin. Most propeller aircraft have a tail fin standing upright at the back of the plane, but the Pogo had a second mirror image tail fin, this one pointing downward. They too were a lot bigger in proportion to the body of the plane than a normal tail fin, sort of crammed up toward the cockpit in a somewhat claustrophobic configuration. When it was at rest, the Pogo would perch upright, sitting on the trailing edges of its two wings and two fins, perched on a little wheel at each tip. Those wheels were supported on several foot-long struts meant to compress inward by several feet when they landed, in a move reminiscent to the Pogo stick where the aircraft got its name. And nor was the downward-pointing tail fin the only oddity on board the Pogo. Powered by an Allison XT40A14 turboprop engine and designed to incorporate a more powerful engine called the Allison T54, the Pogo utilized two propellers, both mounted on its nose, instead of just one. Those propellers were built to be contra-rotating, which is to say that one rotated clockwise and the other counterclockwise, in a design that's somewhat more energy efficient than a regular propeller, although its awful capacity to generate noise, its added weight to the front of a plane, and its mechanical complexity have generally made such a design uninteresting for global aeronautical engineers. They can be found on late variants of the British Supermarine Spitfire and the Soviet Tupolev Tu-95, but mostly they're a feature of various prototypes throughout time, with the occasional production aircraft usually not making it past a couple of hundred copies. In terms of what the craft was actually capable of, it's rather difficult to say, seeing as it never progressed to the level of testing that would have generated clear answers on those specs. Sitting empty, it weighed a bit over 5,000 kilograms, that's 11,155 pounds, with an expected service ceiling of about 37,500 feet or 11,500 meters. It was expected to boast an impressive rate of climb and a top speed that, while it would have still come in below the speed of sound, was expected to be somewhere around the 4 to 500 mile per hour range. It was a single seater, measuring just 31 feet long with its delta wings 26 feet wide. While the prototype was never fitted with armament, the Navy did have a fairly good idea of what they wanted on board. At the time that the plane was undergoing early testing, the plan was to configure it with either a total of 48 unguided aerial rockets or a total of four 20mm cannons, two each mounted on the tips of the horizontal plane wings. The cockpit was specially built for the aircraft's flight star with a rotating chair that could sit at about a 45 degree angle when the plane was sat on its wingtips and rotate to a regular front-facing orientation when in flight. The cockpit was also equipped with a rope so that the pilot could get out safely in case of an emergency vertical landing away from the testing field. Finally, the lower tail fin was built to be jettisoned in the event that the craft had to make an emergency horizontal landing, although whether it had a set of horizontal landing gear is less clear. The Pogo's first flight took place on April 29, 1954, with test pilot and marine reservist James Coleman, better known on the airfield as Skeet, behind the stick. On that day, the Pogo was rigged up to safety lines for a test flight that was very much the first of its kind. At the time, no American aircraft of similar size or engine power had ever attempted a vertical takeoff and landing, so in case something went haywire, a tether in the nose was ready to hoist the aircraft off the ground before it could take a little hop and crash catastrophically. Each wingtip was kept steady by another line in the Navy's best attempts to keep the whole apparatus steady. The Pogo's tether tests would go on for months. Skeets would log over 60 hours of flight time under these conditions, while those inside the hangar battled against the incredible airflow the downward pulling, contra rotating propeller system would generate. Several times, the tethering mechanism was the only thing that stopped the Pogo from falling onto its side, but by the end of that summer in 1954, the plane was deemed ready to move outside. 
On the first try, August the 1st, the pogo lifted 20 feet from the ground, a little over half its length or about 6 meters. On the second try, it rose up to 150 feet or 45 meters. For the next three months, Skeets and his team would perform another 70 flights of that same kind, taking off, hovering for a bit, and landing before the moment of truth finally came on November the 2nd of that same year. On that day, the pogo lifted straight up from the ground before transitioning into horizontal flight, flying for 21 minutes, hovering a bit longer, and then setting back down on the ground. In subsequent flights, Skeets would take the pogo to heights of over 3,000 meters, 10,000 feet. Even with limited experiences like these, the Navy started to realize that the pogo was more than capable of some pretty impressive feats. Even with its throttle set for minimum power, the plane was flying well past 300 miles per hour, 500 kilometers per hour. In fact, because of the lack of speed brakes or spoilers on the airframe, the Pogo often outran the chase aircraft that was supposed to be monitoring it. The plane was able to transition to horizontal flight just 50 feet or 15 meters above the ground in an exceptional feat that later jet-powered VTOL aircraft would take decades to match. Skeets was able to work out a mechanism to land the plane upright, approaching the place where he wanted to land by flying horizontally low to the ground and then pitching straight up, cutting engine power, and letting the plane lose airspeed until it was hanging in midair. Then he'd fire up the engines and stop at just the right moment to hover, then gradually cut the power until the plane was ready to land. But these test flights also revealed myriad issues with the Pogo's design, not least of which was its inability to control its trajectory at low speeds. This was an issue in horizontal flight, but it got much worse when hovering. The aircraft was just not stable and constantly had to be course corrected in midair in order to guide itself down. The problem only got bigger when the plane came close to the ground, with Skeets forced to fight the controls because of the immense backwash of his propellers and the way that the compressed air interacted with both his plane and the ground. Skeets was able to boast a 100% success rate in getting the aircraft down to the ground, but he was a very talented test pilot who had spent a whole lot of time getting every element of the Pogo's controls memorized perfectly. Even for Skeets, the Pogo's instability while in a hovering descent was just one of a wide range of problems. Because of the way the cockpit was oriented, landing involved looking almost directly up at the sky, where there was no reference point to measure the rate of his descent. A small radar altimeter was provided to help correct that issue, with a green-yellow-red lighting system to indicate when the aircraft was in a stable hover, with a safe rate of descent, with the green and yellow lights displayed, or when it was moving toward the ground at an unsafe rate of over 10 feet per second, the red light flicked on. But even then, a large part of his landings consisted of trying to look over his shoulder and gauge his rate of approach to the ground below. Making matters worse, the ejection seat on the pogo was widely considered to be unreliable, to the point where hangar technicians eventually decided to simply disarm it. Skeets never once closed his canopy while flying the pogo, always preferring to leave it open in case he had to manually heave himself out of the aircraft in an attempt to avert an emergency. Other practical issues proved no easier to deal with. Because the pogo was landing on tiny little wheels at the four tips of its wings and fins, there was no real way to build a mechanism that could break those wheels once they were on the ground. Landing conditions with a steady breeze just a few miles per hour, let alone a stiff gust of wind, and the pogo would find itself careening one way or the other, with a good chance of wiping out anything in its path, or if it were on the water, falling overboard. Despite the pogo looking fairly small, we're still talking about a plane that was little on the scale of aircraft, that is to say, still big enough to squish anybody trying to hold it still with their hands. Well, this was fine for a prototype, but it would have needed to be corrected before a production line plane was ever built, and the engineers on the project had little idea how they could do that. And not only that, but the plane's tactical use was also in question for several reasons. The Pogo was a prop plane, not capable of hitting Mach 1, meaning that the aircraft of the time, including test aircraft that could fly at up to twice the speed of sound, would have been able to badly outclass it by the time it went into production. Not only that, but the idea that it would have been of such great use in defending ships was also in doubt. The aircraft's small size and high-powered engine would have meant a likely low endurance, meaning that the idea that a few Pogo aircraft could hold off an incoming attack really only made sense as long as there was air support nearby. To illustrate why that is, we'll give you an example. Say you're attacking a ship with three Pogos on board with a wave of nine aircraft. Maybe if you throw all your planes at this ship at once, the Pogos and the ship's anti-aircraft guns can hold off your planes until they've got to turn back because of low fuel. But send three, and then another three, and now it's the Pogo that's all but guaranteed to run out of fuel before the last of your aircraft have to depart. At best, the Pogo would have been a delay tactic, and while that delay might have helped in very specific conditions, it wouldn't have been nearly so useful as to justify changing the US Navy's entire doctrine and approach in order to accommodate it. 
Eventually, it came time to let somebody else behind the stick of the pogo, and all of its problems were put on full display. The next person to try and fly it was John Neville, taking his first shot in May of 1955 without experience on the tether rig that Skeets had found to be so critical. The test flight was a disaster, and although after a full year the build team was able to move the rig to the test flight field where the pogo was in operation, it was already too late. Skeets had moved on from the project by then, the pogo's gearbox was showing its age, some of the metal inside the prototype was degrading, and perhaps most importantly, the Navy was losing interest. Once thought to be too impractical for fleet-wide adoption, fixed-wing jets were now proving able to fly off from aircraft carriers and land back on them, and the strategic and tactical issues with the pogo meant that it lacked the sorts of redeeming value that might see the project continue. Finally, the clearly immense training requirements of the pogo, plus the apparent need for tether rigs as a teaching aid, were prohibitive to large-scale implementation, while the extra talented pilots who did stand a chance of flying it belonged behind the stick of a high-performance jet fighter rather than doing guard duty with a prop plane on ships that weren't even important enough to be near an operating aircraft carrier. The Pogo would fly for the final time in November 1956, by which time the Navy's VTOL program had been shuttered. It spent a few years as an informal, beloved gate guard at the Naval Air Station Norfolk, Virginia, until 1973, when it was transferred to the National Air and Space Museum in Maryland in the United States. In the decades after it flew, other aircraft would achieve the VTOL dream. In the United States, the V-22 Osprey is a troop transport aircraft that uses two helicopter-like wings to ascend and descend before pivoting into horizontal flight mode, while Britain's Harrier jump jet was capable of takeoff from extremely short horizontal runway paths, and the modern F 35 Lightning II uses lift fans to levitate from the ground before engaging in regular horizontal flight. The method the Pogo used to get off the ground, rather unsurprisingly, did not make a comeback, but it did turn the Pogo into the sole owner of a dubious but still impressive flying distinction, the weirdest little aviation pioneer that ever did fly.